you don't have you don't have a black person's empowered movement without the fact that you acknowledge that they're black people. You don't have an LGBTQ plus plus movement, whatever it is, without the fact that recognizes that there are all these distinctions within this within this group, right? Um, it, it's distinctions are so important for our humanity. Otherwise, what do we have? It's like a m- intuitive leadership mastery the podcast for entrepreneurs and leaders like you who want to double profits and half stress by improving your business intuition learn how with your host Michaela Light Welcome back to the show. I'm here with Justice Barclay, back on the show again after a five-year break. And we're going to be talking about how female entrepreneurs get a bit of the short end of the stick. And we're going to focus on wombs, turfs, and trans to elucidate and illuminate that topic because uh, there was a recent very heated discussion, though it had a lot of consciousness and love in it as well, uh, that we had on Facebook Um well, Justice had it on Facebook. She was the hostess of that discussion. I think that's the correct technical term, right, Justice? Sure, yes. Yes. And um, we're going to talk about um, gender and patriarchy and matriarchy and how that affects our businesses, um, both for men and women. There are some men who listen to this show as well. So I think this affects everyone who's human. If there are any robots listening, it probably won't affect you, but you know, we're not going to worry about that. Um, and if you haven't met Justice before, uh, she's a uh, wild woman, writer, witch, matriarch, and conscious provocateur. Wow, what a bunch of titles you've got there. Um, <laughs> she was also, <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, forget about being CMO or CEO or anything. Yeah. Um, and she's also a certified hypnotherapist and does healing sessions, both one on one, and she also does group sessions. In fact, she was. She's organizing a group uh, women's retreat in September, I want to say, and that's we'll come to how that caused a controversy, how it could be controversial. I do not really understand. Um, I say with tongue in cheek. Um, and she also writes for Elephant Journal and talks about, uh, you know, she kind of pulls out, unpacks things that affect, you know, our humanity and how we feel and heal together, particularly dealing with trauma. I've noticed in some of your writing that you, you, you yourself went through uh, one or two little traumaettes and um, just a couple, <laughs> just a couple. Okay. And, and you've helped people who've gone through trauma to come out the other side and be wildly successful people and happy and healthy. Um, so welcome justice. Thank you, Michaela. It's nice to see you again. Yes. Great to see you. We originally met gosh, many moons ago at some uh, energy healing, worky shoppy thing that you were doing at the time um, yes. with, with your father, uh, whose name must not be mentioned or something. Um, <laughs> no, just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> he who shall not be named. <laughs> he who shall not be named. Yes, but, um, I, but I remember it, you. Oh, well, that's nice to know. I, re- I remember you too. You were very, it was a great multi-day workshop where we learned energy healing and uh, you were assisting. And I think you did a bit of talking on stage at one point, if I remember right, along with the dolphins and whales. And, a bit. And, and yes, it was very fun. And it was a great introduction for me to some of this, oh, you can change reality by, you know, shifting the energy and using your intuition to detect things. So fabulous uh, work. But you've gone beyond that now and you do your own thing yeah i'm not naming the work deliberately um so, yes um but for people listening you know if you if you're an entrepreneur you're probably affected by how men and women treat each other you know and if you're a female entrepreneur you've probably noticed that men are not always accepting and kind and supportive when it comes to your entrepreneurial efforts so i mean that's what i've noticed <laughs> Have um, this. Yes. So tell us, let's talk a bit more about, about that on female entrepreneurs and the patriarchy, the matriarchy, misogyny. Oh, those are such long words. You know, it's, it's regrettable. Um, so many things go back to the, the witch trials, honestly, and people don't know this. They think 
a lot of women were brought up as witches because we, you know, had mystical powers, but a lot of it was actually a concentrated effort to remove power from women business holders to take away their ability to run businesses way back, like what, 400, 500 years ago. And I think to a degree, we're still suffering from that. We've had a hard time getting our feet back under us and people don't take women business owners as seriously. We, you know, we're still struggling with overcoming the stigma of women should be running the home, should be raising children. And then you have to deal with the double bind that if you're doing that and you're running a business that you have to do both perfectly. There's as a, as a woman in business, especially if you want to have family, there's almost no way to win. Um, And these stigmas aren't levied against men in the same way. They're just not. I think that's a great, great point. I think there is a uh, a society wide trauma from all that. Uh, what was it called? The uh, Spanish the Inquisition. Inquisition, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Inquisition. But I mean, also the Protestants. That was a Catholic version of it. But mm-hmm. also Protestants got up to it, and I'm sure all the Confucian Chinese have their own version thereof. Because I don't think women in ancient China got treated too well. I mean, in particular, their feet got tied up in fabric to make them so they couldn't walk which seems right. a little constricting you know <laughs> um and i think we could even i mean the wish trials and all that was around 16 something i think mm-hmm. i mean I don't know, my history's not whatever and i i'm not sure what brought that on whether they felt women would get i mean it wasn't just powerful women it was any woman who spoke up i think and some men who spoke up too anyone who was inconvenient it was they had like a literal effing witch hunt Right? right, where anyone who is inconvenient to the people in power or to your neighbor who's a bit irritated with you, oh, well, let's just accuse them of being a witch and and that'll get rid of them. Or um, who wanted your land. I mean, there was, there was all kinds of power grabs that went on under the guise of labeling people as heretics and seizing their land, their mm. title, and their power. It was a massive power consolidation grab on the part of the Catholic Church and on the part of the patriarchy. And we haven't recovered completely. Wait a minute. That, that's an oxymoron. Catholic church, patriarchy, they're the same. <laughs> they're both patriarchies. They're not the same thing. But the Catholic church is pa- patriarchal. We Absolutely. haven't had a woman pope consciously ever. And the only women popes we've had, they kind of slipped in pretending to be men, I think. I think that was the deal. Mm. Uh, I forget what pope that was, but there was at least one pope that was technically a woman. Right. Um and it's very interesting to me now you say that uh, witch hunts and heresy, because coming back to today, that's exactly what's happening, not with, you know, the Spanish Inquisitor or whatever that dude was, and, um, you know, burning fires and being drowned to prove you were innocent, which seems a little counterproductive, right? They used to <laughs> put the witch underwater and if she floated up she was a witch and then she should be burned at the stake or killed some <clears> other <throat> way but if she drowned she was an innocent loving person and then they bury you in sanctified ground yes. and all is forgiven yes. but you're still dead <laughs> but this phrase of witch hunt continues today you know we had the witch hunt in the 1950s in the united states with mccarthy but now on social media people are witch hunted and you know jk Rowling uh, has been witch hunted she hasn't been brought down because <laughs> she's got more whatever centeredness and groundedness and a few billion dollars to tell them to f off um no i mean she's a strong woman but we have heresies now right i mean back then the heresy was Absolutely. if you didn't follow the catholic church but now if you don't follow like certain very narrow social constructs like one of them trans men are women trans men women are god i'm getting confused myself here um trans women are women is one and therefore they must be allowed to play in women's sports and go in women's restrooms and go in women's prisons and so forth mm-hmm. even though they haven't necessarily had the operation to snip off any uh, <laughs> body parts that might do things that you wouldn't want uh, mm-hmm. if you were in those safe spaces. So I, I think this continue, This is echoing down in today and in, in a different, you know, different flavor. I love how you brought it down through that because it very much has that feeling of um, the quality of being, of being witch hunted because 
you, you know, if you are labeled as a turf or as, as, you know, somebody who wants to stand up for our right to have distinctions between being woman or trans woman, which I guess technically makes a person turf, which what is the definition of turf? It's a, it's a trans exclusionist radical feminist, which is the label that has been flung at. What the heck does that mean? I mean, who thought up that (laughs) phrase? I mean, it's a bunch of, well, I, I don't want to be upsetting to people listening, but I'm just going to speak my truth, which is that's a bunch of progressive gobbledygook, mm. trans exclusory radical feminist. Mm. Yes. Okay. Well, trans, I understand that. That's people who want to change their gender exclusionary. I'm just unpacking it a little bit. Yes, please. Help, help me out. You know. Yeah. But um, the exclusionary means you don't don't you don't want to deal with them or you don't want to you excluding them somehow and then. Radical. I'm not sure what that means in this context. It means extreme, I guess. And then feminist means someone who is pro women. I think. I mean, so I'm probably I totally that. misdefining these things. But what turf actually means is you're an evil word beginning with C that I'm not going to mention because it's one of those seven words that gets us banned. <laughs> I think we should reown that word myself. Same. And um, God, I've lost my train of thought now. Uh, <laughs> it, it basically is a put down, you know, it's saying you're so evil, you have to be ostracized from the, so ostracized from the social group. Well, yeah. and for it to be effective in as as a tool for for witch hunting to, you know, to use our, our term that we're using, you actually have to agree that being exclusionary is a bad thing, that people are not allowed to have exclusive spaces. And we have had exclusive spaces for different specific reasons and groups. All, all through society, all throughout time immemorial, you have AA for Alcoholics Anonymous, NA for Narcotics Anonymous, and they don't they don't want people who are non addicts attending their meetings because it doesn't fit the intention of the group. Right? Same with social clubs. Same with Masons. Same with there. There have been distinctions in the creation of exclusive groups for as long as we have been functioning as a society. Well, what's the problem with people getting together and having something in common, you know, and being able to keep the conversation focused because they all have a similar experience? I mean, right. Seems pretty natural to me, but apparently for some people that's terribly upsetting and we should be <clears throat> branded with a, a letter T. So it's a catch 22. Because what I've been told as someone who wants to host a woman's retreat specifically for people who identify as a woman who have come up through um, the life initiations of womanhood that revolve around having a womb, I'm allowed to create this space. I'm allowed to, you know, I'm al- allowed to create it online. I'm allowed to have it host it in, in person. But when I'm so not. Far. So far, but what I'm not allowed to do, what makes what makes me a turf is the fact that in order for this space to exist, I have to acknowledge that there are distinctions that makes this space available and acceptable to certain people and that it is not acceptable and available to others. And this distinction in this regards is that there is a distinction between being a trans woman and being a woman biologically. And if I make that distinction, then that makes me a turf makes sense I, it makes sense well i understand the logic of it it doesn't make sense to me i mean right. I think it's pretty pretty effing silly if you ask but you me you can but follow the logic i'm coming from a, i am a trans person trans woman i guess yeah um and i do identify as a woman but i haven't had though you know i don't have all the the biological you know bits and pieces i mean i do right. have some i've been taking hormones and i've i've got some of the things happening and i do have some whatever but it's not the same and i didn't have it when i was growing up so i didn't go through all the you know experiences of you know puberty and having people harassing me well i have been harassed sexually and i have have been i haven't been raped but i've i came quite close to it one time (laughs) by a guy i should say um naturally well no you can't women can rape too but it's a lot rarer you know, it is much rare. Yes. No, yeah. I, I know of I know of many instances in which this occurred, but it it does tend to come from um from it comes men. To can, yeah, it tends to come from men, partly because they they 
behave more aggressively. And I think rape is less of a sex. I mean, yeah, there's a sexual aspect to rape, but a lot of it's a pack move, you know, absolutely subjugate someone. And it doesn't really matter whether you're using a that body object that begins with P or you have a, a bottle or your hand or mm. whatever, you know, it's, it's all about control and subjugation, which dehumanization. Um, Oh, well, I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah, dehumanization, ob- objectification. God, these, yeah. if we get too many, my dyslexia can't handle long words. I get overload. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't go through the same experience. And, you know, you want to have a group to discuss more women centered things? What's the big deal? And I don't know. I, I don't, you know, I don't. And I'll tell you, I have a lot of trans friends and most, trans friends i have don't subscribe just for people listening because you may not have many trans friends necessarily most trans people i know don't agree with this radical hate type thing where you try and take down people because they don't agree with this somewhat radical idea that you know if a man one day wakes up and says i'm a woman then you have to accept they're a woman immediately right so well, and I, I mean, we discussed this before we began recording. I asked you because I didn't know what pronouns you identify with. And you told me you uh, pronoun schmo nouns. <laughs> but this is a very big deal to some people. And if you get their pronouns wrong, they become deeply offended. And it's not necessarily like there's an intentional insult behind that misunderstanding. There's just a lack of knowledge. And it's not everybody's priority to educate themselves on what the current acceptable, specifically, you know, kind of liberally engineered lingo is um, for whatever social issue it is that we're discussing. There's just too flipping many of them. Um, Not not all of us. Not all of us are. I'm I'm glad. Yeah, I, it's it's frustrating and it's hard to keep up. And and I love. I'm glad you use that word engineering. And we'll talk more about that later in the episode because I really do feel there's some under the there's an undercurrent of deliberate engineering going on with this. And it's not it's not organically being birthed into the world. You know, some things organically happen, maybe with a bit of help. You know, like racial equality. I feel that. Okay, there were people like Martin Luther King and many other people who worked to make racial equality happen. But there was also an organic sense that this is justice, right? This is fair. Right. I don't think that's what's happening here. But it sounds as though it was. And if you don't agree with Mm -hmm. it, you must be a really evil, bad person. Mm Mm-hmm. You're listening to the Intuitive Leadership Mastery Podcast. Get detailed show notes on today's episode together with your free What Would It Take Business Intuition Guide at intuitiveleadershipmastery.com. And now, back to today's show. Well, I mean, it's so curious. It's so curious with the process of dehumanization because you're you're talking about Mm. a a, a group of people, you know, trans people, men or women, who chose to identify differently because that was how they felt inside of themselves. And many of them, as I understand, and as you said, have experienced this process of dehumanization. And yet when somebody, you know, such as myself, who is a woman, you know, says that, no, I'm sorry, there is actually a biological distinction. There is immediately this piling on of dehumanization that, that goes into this sort of witch hunt. So it's like, how does it serve us as people? How does it serve us as trying to understand or communicate with each other to take the same tactics that they've experienced that have been so painful and then use it against the, the very demographic of people that they say that they want to be accepted as? It's very confusing to me. That I don't understand at all. Well, I think there are several aspects to that. One is we, women are easier to attack. If you did the same kind of attack moves on men, they probably you know, push back. Whereas women want to appear in their social circle as loving and kind Mm. and good. And that's not true for men. 
you know, obviously most men like to be good and loving and kind, but that's not their primary driver. I don't think. Mm. Whereas I, I think for women having social acceptance in your circle and correct me if I, I mean, you know, I'm speaking from someone who's observed womanhood from, you know, this, whatever the, the more edge of the female spectrum. Mm. Um, so it's easier to beat up women over this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so no, that's matter. partly, and then I, I think there is when, when we go, when we get to the social engineering part, I really do feel that because of what we talked about earlier, that women are very powerful We're in contact with our intuition, you know, our magical abilities, our witchy abilities, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's perceived as dangerous by mm. many men and dangerous by the patriarchy. And they actually want, don't, they don't want women to be powerful. And coming back to something you, you mentioned earlier, I don't think we said it explicitly in the recording. They don't want women to exist. They want yeah. to remove women. In fact, I, Oh, I guess I'm going to jump into this now. I think their ideal is a sexless, you know, society where people can be controlled. Because if you didn't have the sex urge and families and marriage, just think how much easier it is to control all the, you know, the dehumanized widgets. So, and, and you know that women that women are a defense against that, right? Because they're strongly standing for their femininity and womanhood and inclusion and. What, sorry, I'll let you speak. Oh, I, no, I I'm, excited. I, it's, I'm, I'm excited too. Um, I, you, the erasure of sexual identification in general sort of points to an underlying transhumanist agenda because if you don't have the distinction between, well, women have wombs and women bear baby, bear children, right? Suddenly men can do that because they have wombs because like there, there becomes all this sort of, this dissolving of these kind of um, just natural products of our biology. Um, next thing you know, and I've, I've seen this, you've got people who are, are advocating for growing babies in pods. Like you have no more use for, for women and women in the society are, we're typically sort of the role of mother is moderately accepted. The role of maiden is highly praised for our youth, for our beauty, for our sexuality. We start moving into these deeper levels and values that revolve around femininity, protection of life, protection of our personal spaces, of our bodies, creativity, intuition, um, the, the ability to hold the life and death cycle with inside of ourselves. Um, and birth and resurrect life. This is something that is biologically an imperative to us. You start erasing that distinctions and you're, you're actually even more so you're limiting the role of womanhood in society, not only as a function, but as a mythological force of who we are and what we're capable of. It's extremely hateful. I think it is. And it, it's, I think it's being done to put, to be able to control not just women, but also men as well, because yeah. but the flip side of this women don't exist or strong women don't exist. Or, you know, I mean, the earlier thing that we said, I want to get this sentence into the podcast that you said, uh, women don't exist independent from men. And I wrote in fathers and husbands, because that's traditionally, you couldn't own property as a woman a few hundred years ago, 200 years ago, I want to say, it's not that long ago. You, you couldn't, couldn't get even a credit own card a house a or a business. Yeah. That was only 30 years ago, I want to say. Right. You couldn't get a credit card as a woman. Um, or they expected your husband to trot in to co-sign stuff, you know, business loans and things. And I think we finally have moved more or less from that, although we don't always get respect in business meetings or at banks, you know, as women. Um, and I do, so I, I just wanted to get that in. And then also this thing about moving to birthing children from pods or machines. I mean, that's straight out of the novel Brave New World, if you've ever read that, mm. um, where they genetically engineered the different classes. You know, they had worker classes A through, through I think, E, where A's were like, did the intellectual work and B's were managers. And I, I, don't know, I forget all the letters, what they got up to, but E's were like, you know, they just dig roads or whatever. Mm -hmm. and they were all brought up without a mother or a father. There was mm -hmm. no family, and they were totally controlled by society. And also, in addition, in that novel, they were all drugged, you know, using a drug they gave out to everyone. Um, 
called Soma, I think, that stopped them kind of getting too conscious, getting too uppity on mm. the slave plantation that mm -hmm. the whole world was. Um, great novel. Um, I mean, that, that and you haven't read that one. Well, it's worth checking out. I'd see if it resonates with you, you know. But I mean, it, it was written around the same time as uh, 1984, you know. So they both were dystopian read. views. That one you've read, yeah. Well, we've got a lot of 1984 going on mm -hmm. right now. And that sort of ties into some of this stuff with the trans and male and women, because in the novel 1984, there was a lot of control of, of speech and uh, thought and history. There was editing of history. There was editing of speech. And it ends up editing what you're allowed to think. And I think that's what happens with some of this trans stuff and turfs and women's stuff. We're not even allowed to think these things, not allowed to speak them, not allowed to write them, not allowed to tweet them. Maybe right. that's changed now because they're changing who owns Twitter. So maybe we will be allowed to tweet it. But for the last few years, it's been, uh, quotes, illegal, socially illegal to write mm -hmm. these things. You get ostracized. You actually will get kicked off some of these social media platforms if you say some of the things you've said. Wow. I believe. People have been. Well, I mean... I found myself even in writing some of my posts because an additional distinction between being a woman or being a trans woman seemed to need to be made saying womb bearing people. Right. Um, which is it, it's, and, and then you go, okay, so if it's a womb bearing person, does that mean that, a trans man who still holds a womb is now welcome into your spaces because they've gone through the initiations of womanhood. I'm like, well, no, not for this specific space because it is to actually hold women who identify as women who are still going through, or as, as binary potentially, who are still going through, who, who relate to the initiations of womanhood, right? So then that gives me a whole nother layer of like, well, you're, you know, you're a hateful bigot in, the, in that direction as well. Well, well, no, I'm actually just not interested in, you know, having, I would relate it to like having someone who, um, someone who had like, I don't know. It's I, I can't even think of it. I'm like, I'm going to all these addiction models and thinking like, well, gambling and an AA. No, that's still an addiction. So that doesn't quite work. Um, but it's an important distinction where it's not a space that is geared specifically to to talk about those issues. It is geared to talk about these scenarios and these issues quite specifically. Right. So then I have to. Well, I mean, we've got all kinds of labels. We've got races, you know, black, yeah. yellow whatever colors people are talking about Latino, even though that's not really a race, that's like an overlay on race. And then you've got religions, right? People, you right. know, Jewish people might have a group to talk about the Jewish religions. They really want okay. Protestants or Confucians or Islamic people to come to that. Not really. No, they don't. I mean, they might have a, they might have guest evening to like help explain Judaism to them, but they don't really want them for the deep discussions of the, the religion itself. Right, because it doesn't actually pertain to them. And to create a discussion that pertains to them, you have to change the intention of the space. Yeah. And I don't think that we should be required to change the intention of our spaces. It's um, only women who are required to do this, I feel. I don't think any right. of the other groups. It's not like people are going around and saying, oh, this Muslim group must let in Christians because, like, you know, it's anti-Christian to not, right. you know. And the reason that they're not doing that is it comes back to the erasure of the biological distinction in the first place, that if you identify socially, sexually in this specific way, that that automatically erases, erases that, that biological distinction and it doesn't and it can't. I have seen some papers that are now this sort of new science that's coming out that are saying that gender is not actual a biological reality as well. Well, I'm sorry. I was born with ovaries and I was born with a uterus and I have created a baby inside of me. And it doesn't matter how long you, Michaela, identify as a woman, you, you've been alive longer than me and perhaps identifying as a woman longer than I have existed. You can't make a baby. That is a biological reality and a necessary distinction when we're talking about 
how we move and operate um, in relation to each other. And it matters. Well, I, I think it does matter. And I, I just want to come back to that languaging womb bearing people because <laughs> in the United Kingdom, they use some similar phrase you know, in the National Health Service, when you go to the hospital, they kind of don't want to identify men and women. Now you're either, wo- you know, baby womb. I, I forget what their phraseology is, but they can't wow. effing use the word woman. Right. And that's another right. erasure of womanhood. And and it's got to the point now because of tran- trans, some trans men still can get pregnant, even right. if they don't identify as women necessarily. Um, and they have a new icon, you know, an emoji that shows a pregnant man for that reason. I don't know if you've seen that around I have as well. Seen. It's very whatever. But the whole the point I want to make is why can't we reown the word woman and the word mm-hmm. man for nearly everyone on the planet? 99% of people, it's pretty effing clear whether someone is a woman or man. Mm-hmm. You don't have to go and open up their abdomen to see, check if they have ovaries or a uterus. Yeah. You can tell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think nearly every human can tell if someone's a man or woman. And maybe we'll yes. talk more about that if we didn't already. I don't think we did in this. I get confused what we talked about before I hit record. And afterwards. Well, I mean, I think, you know, the fact that we're supposed to police our thoughts to the degree where we don't recognize oh. that natural gender distinction is, um, yeah, it's it's we can't help ourselves. And I think part of that is the underlying biological imperative of life is to reproduce. So whether we're consciously deciding whether we want to like hook up and take this person to bed or not, there is an underlying unconscious noticing going on when we run into someone, is this person possibly a reproductive mate for me? And then if you're meeting them in and person, a good one. there's and a good one, there's an exchange of pheromones. So the very first thing that our body wants to know is biologically, like I'm a, uh, I have female reproductive organs. Does this person have male reproductive organs? Could we potentially make a baby? It's not a conscious thing. It It's unconscious. It is, it is the way that survival continues on the planet. So we, it's not something that socially we can we can delete the language from our lang- delete it from our language, but from a biological standpoint and the way that we function unconsciously, it's not something that we can take away. I, I'd agree with that. I, I think within half a second, people gender other people they meet, however they meet them, whether it's or they try to, and if they can't, they get very anxious. Like mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember that a comedy show saturday night live snl and they used to have a recurring co- character called pat which is a deliberately androgynous name and you could the whole joke of that whole sequence of sketches is no one could tell if pat was the man or woman and they would kind of lead up to something that was you know pat said oh i was away at the weekend and i was at something and you'd think you were just about to gender the pat and you but then you were frustrated and you couldn't, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, I remember that one. But the whole reason that was funny is because it's so, there's this such an urge to gender people. And I'm going to say yes to what you said that, yeah, there's some part, it probably is subconscious. Maybe it's our, you know, our wombs and penises that want to decide this. You know, maybe it's happening at that level of our body. But also, I think it happens in the brain and the heart. Yeah. Um, and also, because we live in a patriarchy where men are on top and women are on the bottom, we want to know how should we tr- treat this person? Should we give them extra respect because they're a male or should mm. we give them less respect because they're female? And that's at such a low level. It, um, gosh, I'm trying to remember the name of this woman. She's at Georgetown university and she wrote a, uh, a book about gendered language. Uh, Barbara Tannen, Deborah Tannen, that's her name. I'll stick a thing in the show notes. Um, but she did a lot of studies of this. And one thing she did is she listened to receptionists at businesses answer the phone. And if you've ever called a business, I'm sure all of us have, and you've had a woman, rece- some businesses still don't have automatic computer, blah, blah, blah. They actually have a human being because they think they make more sales that way, which I think is true. If a woman answers the phone, she typically will go into a high girly voice, submissive, right? I'm sure you've noticed this. Like, hi, yeah. this is ABC Company. Can I help you? Yeah. But yeah. what was interesting, if she was talking to a man on the other end, she'd stay in the girly submissive voice. If she was talking to another woman, she'd drop 
her voice and relate as a woman. Mm. So, but she had to hear the other person before she could decide. Fascinating. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah. And I think this happens in society. We interact with people and we're trying to figure out because we're in a patriarchy and the whole deal with patriarchy is a hierarchy, right? The way men typically operate is top dog, bottom dog, top dog, bottom dog pattern. Who's going to boss who around? Whereas mm-hmm. women tend, I mean, this, is, this is a generalization. There are some men who don't do this. There are some women who do do it. Uh, and women tend to more work in a shared group. You know, we're all in this together in a circle kind of thing. More cooperative. And and the other thing, if you ever read her book, uh, I think it's called You Just Don't Understand. I think that's the title of it. I'll, I'll put it in the show notes exactly what it is. But she also recorded interactions of people speaking and found out that women use a different syntax. They have a different grammar from men. They have a different vocabulary. There's all kinds of differences. And when women are speaking together, it's like a shared conversation. They're always interrupting each other. When men are talking, they hold, they don't let anyone interrupt. And one man talks and then mm. another man talks. Right. So, anyway, mm. I've been talking far too much for projecting my femininity. So. <laughs> but everything that you're bringing forth is so, it's interesting. It's relevant. And like my, my train of thought is like, oh, I want to follow that. And I want to follow that. And I want to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> like I want to find the the one thread that I really want to um, that I want to address, and you're talking about the sort of submissiveness that is expected within the feminine. That was actually something that I was addressing specifically that got this whole conversation started for me. Um, I'm in the coaching industry. I'm I'm you know privy to lots of different coaches and different models of healing, you know, in social media world, it just, it comes through my awareness. One of the things that comes up a lot is what's called polarity coaching, which is something that David Dida is essentially the godfather for. And it, it kind of subtly and not so subtly, it grooms the feminine to be submissive to the mass, to to the dominant masculine. And there are traits, I think that within us that naturally exist, but it it essentially, it's an infantilization of the feminine. It's sort of an, an over, um, you know, maturation of the masculine, but it promotes these underlying trauma, um, traits that the masculine in his traumatic state is more dominant, that the feminine her and her traumatic state tends to be more submissive. It's how we survive because feminine women, we don't typically fare well if we go up against men. So in order to survive a dominant masculine aggressive encounter with a man, we do better if we resort to fawning and we do better if we submit, we're more likely to survive a situation. That's just, that has been, that's been a long time survival tactic for women. So the misogyny that gets enfolded in this specific form of coaching is that it promotes these traits as being idealistic, relational um, strategies between the masculine and the feminine. My original post, I was calling out misogynist male coaches, and that's who I was specifically speaking to, but because I had used the language. If you, (laughs) if you don't have a womb, essentially, then stay out of the feminine mysteries. Like mind your F hole was, was like my closing statement on that post. And I had a trans woman come in and essentially tear at me because I was making that distinction that people who don't have wombs should not be teaching feminine mysteries. Okay, so the feminine mysteries revolve around the initiations of the womb. So no, you shouldn't, period. It's not to say that trans women don't have lots to offer in regards to how femininity functions into the energy and the energetic dynamics of femininity. That's not what I was talking about. So essentially, I got brought, this whole conversation got brought out of me because I experienced from a trans woman a very misogynist approach to the material that I was addressing within the misogynist community. (laughs) How ironic. (laughs) How ironic, right? And then I was told that I was, and then, and from there it was, it was brought in that I was potentially a turf and that I was bigot and all of this other stuff that got lumped onto that. 
But what was no. interesting to me in that discussion, you know, I think you said you lost five Facebook friends who unfriended you through that, which is pretty small considering how many no, I got had more than a thousand five friends. Facebook friends who are actually promoting that perspective out of two thousand oh, okay. friends. But they weren't all trans, is my one. point. No, they weren't. I, I think some of them more would identify as progressive. I think that's precisely where they were. Um, so it's very interesting to me. All right, I'm back. I had to take a quick bio break there. I, I find when I'm talking, I got very excited with all these concepts. And I find when a lot of new ideas are coming or spiritual energy is coming, it all goes to my bladder. And <laughs> my body's very smart. It puts all that energy it needs to release in an easy place to release instead of putting it into my left finger, which would have to be cut off in order to release it, which would not be. I heard of someone who did that once, though, that they. They got where they went to see this faith healer called John of God in Brazil, and uh, he moved all their cancer into their little fingertip of their left hand, and then they cut it off, and then they were cured. So, um, yeah, miracle. But I think bladder is a better place to put these things myself. Oh God! And you like don't even get me started on John of God. He's such a scumbag. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we better get off that tangent. We we can talk about it another time. But I I think you were talking about how some people got very excited about how you wanted to have an exclusionary group, and they accused you of being a turf. And it was quite a, it was you know there was an attack, but it was also like okay, let's just not be feel it. Not I don't think you took it as an attack. Really, they were trying to attack no. you and shut you up, but you weren't to be shut up. <laughs> No, it doesn't work very well. <laughs> it doesn't go well for people who try. No, I was picking on one of my favorite subgroups of a-holes being male misogynist relationship teachers. <laughs> well, good and, for them talking to men, but they, they, you didn't want to be told as a woman how to behave no. by them. No. No. It's one thing for men to, and to hold space for women to relax into our femininity. That, that, that's a beautiful, you know, that's a beautiful dynamic that we can enter into with each other. It's completely different for men to tell us how to do it. It's, they're, they're not the same thing. Um, specifically when the instruction is geared towards making us more submissive, making us more infantile and setting us up for predatory relationships that are usually functioning trauma bonds. It's gross. Mm. That's what I was addressing. Right. And so, you mm. know, it was, it was fascinating to me that this, it started out with, with someone who it appeared to me was a trans woman, mm -hmm. um, you know, accusing me of being exclusionary because I was addressing people with out wombs as being unfit to do this. And it, it, you know, if, if the shoe fits, if, <laughs> if you don't, if you, I mean, if you don't bleed, if you haven't at some point had some kind of connection with the sort of the way that our biological reproductive reality affects us physically, physiologically, emotionally, hormonally, relationally, and psychodynamically, then yeah, I will stand in my position that you don't have any business teaching women's mysteries. You don't. And if you don't relate to those experiences, then that's not necessarily, that's not going to be a part of your own psychology and biology and experience. It's not, it doesn't necessarily make it I'm not saying that you can't identify as a woman, I'm not, but there is a distinction there. That is, that is hormonal. That is biological. That is emotional. That is psychodynamic in the way that that process affects us. It is an important distinction. It matters. And this was the distinction that I am not allowed to make as a woman addressing women's issues that there is a this this distinction exists between women and trans women and it is this standpoint that i refuse to give up that according to some people makes me bigoted and um turns me into a turf i i just i mean when you say it's illegal it just in their minds it's illegal it's uh, what the thought police are 
right. criticizing you. You know, it's not actually yet yet illegal. Though I could imagine a future dystopian society where it was actually illegal. In fact, uh, one thing I did notice is that um, in Norway they they put out a law saying you weren't even allowed to have such discussions around women. You know, you couldn't criticize that trans women are women even in your own home with your own family that was still illegal and they were kind of encouraging kids to report their parents and stuff it was quite i'll try and dig up the reference to that for you and the listeners please do that's uh, straight out of 1984 eh? yeah um there's a lot of 1984s things going on with this gender stuff but also with many other things you know with the whole pandemic thing and you know the war thing and i don't know I forget what else, you know, you only have to look at why are people being deleted from Twitter or mm. Facebook or whatever for saying various things. Um, and gender is just one of those right. things. And it is a witch hunt, you know, and um, it's got a very, I, I don't know quite how to put this into words. Maybe you can help me here, but the energy is, it's not just aggressive, but it's, it's coming from a kind of, not good enough or traumatized space that makes it, you know, particularly nasty. I completely agree. And kind of feeling into the psychodynamics around it and the way that my body responds to, you know, having had lots of misogyny leveled at me over the years and having this energy coming at me from trans women, it feels as if the underlying hurt is the same wound that fuels misogyny. And it's, mm. it's so sad and it's so, it really, it really does make me very sad because you, you know, you have this group of people who has gone through so much in order to mm-hmm. identify, in order to be included in this group of women. And yet their next step within that process is to, is to say that the distinctions that exist within us that made them want to be like us in the first place don't exist. Like that feels like it comes from a really hurt place and it lands in me really hurtful. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. It's kind of a spiteful is the word that comes to my mind. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think so I, it's not just aggressive pushing back. It's, it's I want to hurt you. I want to drag you down. Yeah. Kind of. And it's not like I said earlier, most trans people I that I know don't subscribe to this kind of uh, let's a- attack women thing. It's some radical extreme ones who get amplified by social media algorithms or new main means mainstream media news picking up on it because they love to have controversial stuff, right? If it bleeds, it leads as long well, as it's not I've, period bleeding. Right. <laughs> Well, and I've heard that some of the social justice warriors who have actually kind of spurred this movement on are actually men. They're not even trans women. Exactly. It's, like, it's very, it's very intentional and it's very hateful. And it's that kind of intentional hate that will pick up on those sort of underlying unresolved wounded places within us and like create this sort of unconscious attack that comes out of that place. And the word that can't just came to me is destructive. Yes. It's not designed to have a, like you have this thing where you want to bring out nuances and bring out more con- consciousness and around a topic so that we can, we may not all agree, but at least we might agree to disagree or, you know, whatever, right. get along. At and least have a conversation, communicate about it. Like I'm all about communication and, and you know, yeah. That, that and this is around shutting down communication. Yes. And that pisses me off, you know, <laughs> um, but I'm not going to make up a imaginary term like turf to label these people and dehumanize them. <laughs> no, no. I mean, no, no, the, the, the distinction that exists, you know, it's, they are part of our humanity is accepting and celebrating our nuances and differences and distinctions to erase those nuances and differences and distinctions is dehumanizing by the very nature of the process. It's also non-consensual. I mean, if a hundred percent of the Americans or whatever country you're in listening to this wanted to change this fine, well, not fine by me, I'd move somewhere else, but, 
Um, but that's their conscious decision, but it's not being done consciously. It's like this underhand social engineering thing. And I'd like to move to that yes. topic in the discussion. That this isn't like a, a debate we're having in the country or let's, you know, how the, a, a man wakes up and identifies as a woman, then he should be able to be a woman and have his driver's license changed and go into women's lockers rooms, women's bathrooms, women's prisons. Um, I can't think of all the safe women to so go to womb whatever retreats you know yeah the way of womb i don't my think <laughs> there's not there's not a the way of the womb yes we'll make sure to get that into the show notes for people who want to attend um but it's not an open transparent debate and political process and a, uh, some kind of vote and it, it's like a uh, an underhanded social engineering thing that one day you wake up I've had this experience and like there's yet another politically correct thing I'm supposed to be following, whether it's trans, the trans ideology or, or whatever the, the current thing is. And it's, it's another way of getting political change without having to go through all the, the, you know, the transparent process. Yeah. Um, I'll shut up now so you can. Well, and I think, you know, you shared an article on my wall about um, trans people, trans women in women's prisons and the the damage and destruction that that's causing and the inability, because legally you're not allowed to make that distinction between a trans woman and a woman, that these people who still have penises are putting it, being put into, into women's prisons and are trans women are raping women. But you can't say that it becomes woman on woman violence if you're not allowed to make that distinction. And, and socially, the the prison systems, because this this distinction has now been erased out of the language, they're not allowed to discriminate against this violence that's happening because they because they can't say that this is happening from they can't say this is a trans woman doing this to a woman. It's just it's woman on woman violence. So. That to me is extremely disturbing. That was one of the most disturbing articles that I've read um, on the subject material is that women who are already traumatized um, to a large degree, women who wind up in the prison system have come from broken homes, have already been raped, abused, battered, and have more or less, you know, been pushed into something criminal wise. Um, in order to get their needs met and just as a victim of their own circumstances, not to say that they're all victims, but then you, you get these, No, some of them are pretty violent and pathological. Some of them are pretty, too, yes, absolutely, absolutely. But not all of them, but and you, the same in men's prisons, just to be fair to men, you know, fair sure. number of men come from broken homes or went through trauma or whatever before they became criminals and got caught. Right. Um, no, that's but yeah, it is. It is, and I just want to amplify that thing. And I'll share the articles I shared with you in the show notes. Um, it's not just that the trans women are being put in women's prisons; like they share cells. You know, the cell has at least two prisoners in it, so you could easily have a trans woman and a natal woman in the same um, sleeping quarters. You know, and well, in addition, to the to other make that distinction, you could group them all together. But right. they're legally not allowed to. And they could then they probably end up raping each other like like natal men do in men's prisons, just to right. be fair to this whole discussion. Right. And also, I so I think it's ridiculous that they put trans women who haven't had the operation to remove their penis and turn into a vagina into women's prisons. I don't think that should be happening. I'm not sure. I mean, it doesn't work when you put them in men's prisons either, because then the men want to rape the natal men want to rape them. So, right. So I, I and I don't know if you build a separate prison or you have a separate unit within the women's prison or what. Um, right. And I also just want to be fair. The stats that I read said, you know, there were like last year, there were 200 uh, sexual assaults. They called them in women's prisons, of which seven were by trans women on natal women, and the other ones were natal women on natal women. So there's a lot of shit that goes on in all prisons, including women's Valid. prisons. And a lot of rape is a power play and control. Um, you know, I hope I never go into a prison as a prisoner. It's quite traumatizing enough to visit a prison, um, you know, without having to live there. Um but this is the whole thing. This is driven by this social engineering is right. what to me is ridiculous. And that's why I brought that up. Well, it's the erasure of the distinction is why they're not allowed yeah. to separate them. 
Right. Like he and, said, and go to the hospital now there. I want to say part of this whole thing, you know, with the women's swimming competitions where they were letting, you know, trans women compete and then one of them won. They just don't effing care about women. They don't care whether it's fair to natal women, right? That's not even on the table for discussion, right? We have to be hyper fair to trans women, but fairness towards natal women is irrelevant to them. Yes. Thank you for saying that. And it's, you know, one of the curious things from a, like, from a social standpoint is the the movement. And I I don't actually identify as a feminist, but I'm going to use this anyways. The the suffragette movement for women's rights is the, is the movement. It's the grandfather movement that started the, the momentum for all of these other movements for the LGBTQ movement to be able to even get a foothold socially, it was able to do so because this the women's suffragette movement has had so much momentum and so much energy, um, blood, sweat, and tears poured into it for the last hundred years. So you you know you're you're taking a f- it's it's its own distinct thing and yet it is still functioning off of this other movement. You're you're taking a faction that is doing well because of the momentum of this grandfather this grandfathered mo- movement, right? And then small, what seems to be pretty small percentages and factions within that movement in itself are now saying that the distinctions that made the original movement successful are no longer viable. It's like this weird sort of subtly erasing themselves at the same time as they're trying to erase us. And that makes no fucking sense. Oh, pardon That's okay. I don't mind swearing. I just try to be polite with my dainty female personality. I try not to use. I'm not very good at that. (laughs) Even when I'm writing, I'll put a little asterisk in the middle of that f word just so that it might be some other word. Like I, I don't know what it could be. (laughs) Um, I I do want to tie that back. There was, and maybe you can help me remember this. There was a women's liberation camp just for women. And then there was an external camp for trans women because they wouldn't let the trans women into the women's camp. Does that ring a bell for you anywhere? No. I think it was in the Northeast somewhere. Oh, well, I'll try and dig it up later. But that's where some of this stuff got kicked off as well. That You know, the trans women wanted to enter this women only space. You know, it was like a one of those summer festival things where you stay a week and have discussion groups and what have you. Gotcha. Um, Yeah. Um, And then, uh, yeah, you know, this whole uh, liberation movement. Um, I'm not sure it started with women's liberation. That started around 1870-ish, maybe, or maybe a little earlier when some states in the U.S. got women got the vote for, in, for state votes or right. local, for city votes. And um, I guess it may have started around 1800. There were some women writing about women's rights back, well, and before. I'm sure throughout the ages there have been women standing up for women's rights. Um, but it also tied into a lot of other progressive causes around, you know, helping the poor out and. Right, um, and I, I, you know, I can I can emphasize with fairness between humans, between women and men, between blacks and whites, between I don't know, I can't think of what other social gays and straights, and uh, and all those other letters. So I, I've got to slip in a joke here, if that's okay with you, Justice. I had a friend posted this. He said, "I read LGBTQ plus plus, and I can't get it straight." <laughs> But boom, boom. Sorry, I had to say that. <laughs> but, uh, okay. Well, um, all no, of these the, movements the, the, don't exist stuff, I, without their distinctions, right? Like you don't have you don't have a black person's empowered movement without the fact that you acknowledge that they're black people. You don't have an LGBTQ plus plus movement, whatever it is, without the fact that recognizes that there are all these distinctions within this within this group, right? Um, it, it's distinctions are so important for our humanity otherwise what do we have it's like a mush it's like yeah. a, a blobs of people who are all the same and interchangeable units and, and can be killed or reassigned as the powers that be might want that's what the goal is here mate mates whatever the female equivalent is <laughs> <laughs> that's a british word mate mate means friend you know, like or australian it. yes like so 
yeah, let's let's elucidate this because you had a lot of things to say about the social engineering going on, and um, you had some great things you said about that to me before we hit record, and I, I do want to share them with the audience. Well, I just got a shiver of revulsion as you were talking about the sort of like the, the amalgamation and the ability to sort of mold people into being, you know, just these puppets to be, you know, used here or there or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. Because or disposed of or disposed of, yeah, specifically, yeah. right? Um, and that, that just. The, is a tricky word, but like just the concept of there being like an actual underlying transhumanist agenda, which is actually not friendly towards any group of people. Um, the erasure of our humanity and the erasure of our distinctions mm-hmm. within that definitely fits with the idea of a transhumanist agenda. Um, growing babies in pods. So let, let's society. just define that for listeners because it's transhumanist is totally different from transgender. Yes. And it means moving beyond trans always means moving beyond, I believe, or across divides. Right. But in this case, it means the man machine divide and moving beyond n- natural humans and putting chips in their brains or genetically tweaking with them or, you know, turning them into supermen or superwomen or super dogs or whatever. And, um, overcoming ultimately death is my understanding of that yes. thing they want to be able to uh, take a scan of your personality and brain and upload it into a computer into the metaverse owned by mr zuckerberg and right. um yeah very disturbing it's overriding natural human limitation with through the intervention of technology that's- I mean, I'm all for people modifying themselves. You want to get a tattoo? Go for it. Knock it. You want to get a chip in your brain? Fine. But don't force people to do it. Right. So, you know, where this gets into sort of slippery territory, as it always does, is that there is n- the, the unrestrained potential for capital gain from kind of potentially social engineering and preying off of people's gender insecurities is that the pharmaceutical companies who, and the, and the surgical companies who actually perform the surgeries and who manufacture the hormones and medications that allow for these processes to occur, there is no limitation on how much money that they can make. And there is no moral, there's nothing morally or ethically standing in the way. And what's actually happening from this sort of larger social engineering is that if you have a moral or ethical, um, um, what's the, like, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, morally or ethically, if you're opposed, like say I specifically am actually opposed to, um, gender reassignment surgery to children. I, I think it is tantamount of child abuse on the part of the parents because as parents, mm-hmm. it is our job to love, to protect our children, sometimes even from themselves. It is our job mm-hmm. to make sure that they make it to adulthood as safe, sane, whole human beings. It's not to say that transitioning is occurs outside of that spectrum, but a person's brain does not develop in women until about the age of 18. We tend to hit the full maturation of brain development earlier than men. In men, it mm-hmm. tends to, seem to happen until about age 25. So if you're sort of socially promoting this notion that it's that feeling uncomfortable in your skin and wanting to identify as another sex is a problem that can be remedied through hormonal replacement and surgery, you're essentially promoting an ideology that will physiologically, biologically, hormonally, psychologically change a person, permanently alter a person before they have reached the age of brain and emotional maturation to be able to cognitively understand the impact of that decision. For a parent to not intervene. And and to put that more, more. Mm -hmm. Please, no, go ahead. (laughs) Well, I just want to make it more clear. It makes people infertile. It makes the women who, the girls who, who take the puberty blocking hormones or the boys that take them, it makes them infertile. They can't have kids later in life. And it does, it also may affect how they can have, you know, romantic relationships or other things. And yeah, I think, I mean, I'm all for people, adults 
modifying their bodies any way they want to if it's not hurting someone else i mean if i want to steal someone my neighbor's arm and plug it in so i now have three arms that would be wrong because it's stealing someone else's body part right it's not mine but if it's my body and i want to put tattoos on or amputate fingers or change gender go for it you know yes as an adult as an adult and as and, a parent supporting your child through that process, if they want to dress that way, they want to identify that way, they want yeah. to change their name, they want to go to therapy, 100% support them. But going changing their physiology at an age before they can actually cognitively understand what that means for them long term, I think it's negligent. Yeah. I would agree. You know, you shouldn't be amputating body parts, you know, or whatever. Or I would personally take this. To, I mean, this is a bit maybe a bit more radical, but I, I don't think circumcision should be done until you're over 18 either. I concur. For the same reasons. And it 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 destroys some sensitivity in the male organ and has other issues as well. And it doesn't do any of the health things they claim it does anyway. No, so just- anyway, that's just a little tangent tangent at there but i mean here's the other other thing i just want to say which is kind of self-harming for for male boy type people whatever we're calling those now i guess we call them boys shall we um if they take puberty blocking drugs and they take female hormones their genitals don't grow big enough and they can't actually have the operation to turn their penis into a vagina later in life because there's enough skin there so they now have to whip out bits of your intestine to kind of add to the depth of your oh. your new organ. Um, no. So yeah, it's not not. So there it are actually, many reasons why shouldn't if it's a real long term goal that actually prohibits the mm-hmm. the actualization of being able to live that way. It's counterproductive in the yeah. in the male to female thing. And there was a there was a TV thing. I think her name was Jazz. I'll try and dig up her full name. She wrote a book as well. She was a teenage transitioning male to female um, thing. And she wrote quite an insightful book, but she went through quite a lot of trauma. And she did have that exact problem that, you know, because she didn't go through puberty, her penis didn't get that big. And so she couldn't have it flipped around into a vagina big enough. And anyway, um, I think Jazz was her name. I'll look it up. Um, I read the book. It's quite a good book. I've read a lot of transgender books. I'm very fascinated by the subject. Uh, read a lot of books on gender that aren't transgender. They're more male, female stuff. So, Can um, I ask you a personal question? Do you mind? Of course. Okay. So Sorry. you, <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful. You identify as a woman. We use we, we a she pronoun for you. How old were you when you? 58. Oh, when I became, when, when I became. knew four. Yeah, when you knew. Four. My earliest memory is four. Whether I had memory, you know, whether I was female orientated before that, I don't know. But I definitely remember dressing up as a woman and wanting to be a woman and wanting to have a vagina and all that stuff. So, mm. uh, but I kept it all covered up, which wasn't very healthy for me. Sure. So, uh, didn't. Well, and you were living in a different time, it was far less acceptable then. Yeah. And it's, ironic that these time when there's all this pro transgender stuff right now it's so much easier to to come out as whatever right. whether you want to be trans or by bi- you know non-binary or whatever right it's a lot easier to do that now than it was back in the 60s and 70s uh, i was born in 64 so i have memories in the late 60s and it was very gendered society in britain back then i'm sure the states was the same kind of way you know as a what, what's that? Leave it to Beaver. Is that the TV show? I yeah. can't remember the very gendered stereotype stuff. And then in the seventies, we went through a lot of li- women's liberation, you know, moving through those decades and things became, and eventually the, you know, the LBGT stuff, it came more acceptable to be gay, more acceptable to be bi, more acceptable to be trans. Right. Um, so, so yeah. I, I mean, I just I want to make it clear that like I'm not like I don't advocate for a heteronormative way of life as being the only healthy way to to move through life. That's that's how I personally kind of identify. Like I'm a, I'm I'm attracted to men. I've had babies. Uh, I identify as a woman. That that is how I move through the world. I'm more or less monogamous when I'm in relationship. 
but I don't, <laughs> I don't. What a great phrase. More or less monogamous. <laughs> yes. There's, you know, I, there's I, loopholes and, and th- th- there's always room for nuance and, and, and conversation and communication. And in, in my opinion, you know, that's, that's why we communicate not to be right or wrong. I, I'm not suggesting you should get married, but I just had this vision of marriage vows, you know, to love and to hold cherish and more or less be monogamous with you. To more or less be monogamous with each other. <laughs> no, when I, when I lock on to someone and they have my heart and whole body, that's pretty much it for me. But, um, that I've I've had relationship where you know I've I've had I don't identify as a bi and yet I've been I was a bisexual woman but I've been with women, um, I've had you know kind of open sort of navigation in, in earlier relationships and um, I'm a hundred percent for living your life in the way that makes sense to you, um, identifying yeah. and being recognized in a way you're, that makes you're an sense adult. To you. Yeah, you're an adult, you're an adult. If it's not hurting someone else. I mean, there's a difference between cons- conscious non-monogamy and cheating. Just for yes. people listening, Absolutely. I've certainly done the polyamory thing, and which is a, another name for non-monogamous. Um, but the whole key here is being conscious and and not deliberately going out to hurt other people. And if you're an adult and you want to have three of you t- living together or whatever the deal is you know go for it if you want to do it where it's not consensual which sometimes that kind of thing can be with the um you know those mormons get up to some of them do it what was that tv show on hbo about big love big love that was really good because they both showed modern polyamory um and they also had you know a more patriarchal with someone called the patriarch that was his effing title right Right. Um, where it didn't seem quite, and the, the the new wives were getting married when they were only young teenagers. They couldn't really be making a good decision at that age. I don't feel so. Right. I, I right. just want to well, bring that I, that's there. such a great point. Is like we have an illegal age of consent for having sex, mm-hmm. and if you have what sex, is that? It's eighteen. The age, not the sex. Yeah, eighteen. Well, I thought it was younger than that. I thought some states in the union, it's less than 18 to consent to have sex or even get married. I think you can get married at 16 in some states, if not I think, 12. I think it is. I, I think there is variation, but um, typically the age of legal adult in the United States is is 18. And you can get yeah, married for, under for 18, voting, for mi- parental consent. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Right. But, you know, if, you're, if you can't get married, if you're not supposed to be having a you're not really, I mean, I think kids, you know, our sexuality is developing. Um, it, it's always developed younger than people wanted to acknowledge, but the legal age of, of consenting adult for sex in, in most cases is about the age of 18. And it, it just, it makes sense to me. This is a, it's a process that changes you emotionally, physically. Right. And yet we don't want to hold the same kind of standard for going through a process that is going to permanently alter you physiologically. To me, that says that that something's off. That feels like something is off. We can agree socially that this process shouldn't be engaged in until you're of such an age to understand the emotional and physical consequences of it. Mm-hmm. And yet you're a That's- and yet this process where you're going to transition your child to becoming a completely different sex has a completely different set of rules and is under far less scrupulous um kind of yeah that that i i can't connect that in my it's, little it's wrong it's wrong let's huh. just be blunt here it's morally I... wrong and it's being pushed as an agenda by certain people who have i don't know if it's transhumanist or trans something but they're looking to mold society into something that most Americans don't want, but they yeah. can't do it through a, an open, transparent political discussion and process. They need to do social engineering to get there by shaming people, by calling them TERFs Oof. and all the other council culture stuff what? that goes on. And I, I, I'm just going to, you know, I, I'm, it's just wrong. It's evil. It's actually evil, I would say. I mean, I, I don't mean that all the people, all the parents and kids doing this are evil. I'm not, don't get me wrong here. No, they're probably good intentioned. Um, but right. the people who are pushing this agenda in, in 
you know, in the media and in social media and in um, schools, because this is the thing in schools, right? That yes, you know, there's a lot of controversy over, you know, should you let kids transition in schools and should right. you, you know, hold space for people to be able to be cutie. Yeah. T- I can't even say the fucking. Sorry, I'm letting the <laughs> F word out. Maybe they, we should put an F into LGBTQF. <laughs> um no but this is the thing right now you know it's a controversy yeah. that you know what age is it appropriate to even you know to for to to talk about it in schools as opposed to talk about it at home and i want to get in i saw a great i don't know if you watch any of russell brands um, but- yeah he's very good on this kind of nuances and consciousness and what have you and he had a great interview i'll stick it in the notes but he was saying Hey, I'm I'm happy to talk about sex with my kids. My wife doesn't always agree with me on what we should talk about when with, you know, I don't know how old his kids are. They're pretty young, I think. But he says, like, how can you come to an agreement in a whole across the whole of the United States with 350 million or whatever number of population we have about what should be taught in schools to people about this when you can't even agree in your own family, you know, without having a discussion? So that was his view you know you want to talk with your kids about it go knock your socks off but don't try and force it on everyone through a national thing you know yeah i i actually concur with that as well yeah um it's like you know they kids go to school for you know to be to be educated within certain subject material that should not be the provenance of ah. the school system to determine, you know, what other kinds of um, social issues get brought into that education. That is the provenance Mm -hmm. of the parents. Yeah. Well, our great leader and president said that, yes, this week he said, I quote something, I'll quote it in exactly, but it was along the lines of when your kids are on school, they belong to us, the government, and not you, the parents. Our yeah, president, the great that. child sniffer, may he go. <laughs> child sniffer in chief. Just child sniffer in chief. Oh my god! <laughs> I apologize to all listeners who are fans of this man, but there's some serious issues, there unfortunately, and traumas in his family. You know. Well, um, and the fact that we, as a society, you know, are so geared towards this patriarchal mindset that we are continuing to elect leaders who clearly ha- exhibit signs of Alzheimer's and are closer to being in a flipping retirement home than they are to, you know, to the majority. I mean, how old? How old was John F. Kennedy, Kennedy when he became president? I want to say forty-ish. Yeah, the, he was the age of president. The age of consent to be the president is 35, I want to say. In the I think that's correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, let's not go down that tangent. I mean, um, I'd yeah. all be for having JFK as a, or, or an equivalent similar from whatever party is acceptable to people. Um, well, I mean, it, it does speak to the issue at hand that we were talking about, that there is a that there is a majority rule of opinion that is being dis, you know, that's being discarded, that's being um, mm-hmm. invalidated. I, I think yeah. the same thing goes with that. It's like there's this person as a as a leader, you know, who mm-hmm. represents this teeny tiny portion of the minority. And yet he is speaking yeah. for everybody. And I don't think that's right. right. And it's the same issue that we're coming up as with these trans, these certain trans women um, within this, you know, group who are. Yes, who are, it's extreme. It's extreme. And, and, right. and media it's, it and social media. Here's part, of the issue. Here's part of the issue. Okay. Um, media and social media amplify the extremes in society. Yes, you know, indeed. when you've got one or two people who are having extreme views on either either side of a question, right? Because right. there are probably people on the, I don't know what you call the other side to opposite trans, the natal women movement or the whatever. Right. I'm sure I've seen, actually, I have some Facebook, I have one Facebook friend, he's pretty heavyweight Christian, and he's like, there are only men and women and you're not allowed to transition. And, you know, he was quite, you know. Okay. That's the other side of the extreme. That right. it's yeah, that's the other side of the extreme. But and but our media and social media tend to amplify conflict and extremes when really most Americans want to meet in the middle, you know, right. and get along. Right. And 
Um, I think that's part of the issue that goes on in this gender issue and and in many other issues. And and that's why I I'm going to my personal view for the v- vision for the future is we have much more local governance where it's possible where something doesn't have to be decided nationally you know why don't we just decide it in our in our little neighborhood yeah i was going to say town but i don't even want to say town it's like a few blocks that we actually know the people you know why, why don't we just decide stuff there uh and have community and actually have involvement of people and you know that to me makes more sense and i i just want to get in um I don't know if you heard there was a whole controversy in Loudoun County in Virginia. I don't mm. know if you've heard about this. They, I don't think so. Well, the school board made all kinds of decisions for the all the church. It's a big county. It's one of the it's probably easy, either the richest of three thousand counties in the country or second richest. And um, the public school system has a lot of good features. And the school board, I guess, they get elected, but. I, I don't know what happened, but a lot of parents were upset about decisions they were making around gender and around face mask wearing and around racial teaching. Those were the three big issues. And they had a lot of parents come to school board meetings. Usually school board meetings are like empty, right? Hardly a few people turn up. But because the, a lot of parents were in the middle were upset, a lot of people came to this thing and then there was a lot of controversy. And to tie it back to this and and the upshot of this, by the way, was that the election in Virginia changed Democrat to Republican because the the candidate decided to run on this issue because it was so upsetting to so many people. And I think it changed the vote by 15%, which is an enormous switch. There were a lot of people who were upset about it. But I want to tie it back to the trans issue that there was a boy who liked to wear skirts. I don't know if he was fully trans, but he kind of, you know, he was playing with or whatever. And he had a girlfriend and she didn't want to have sex. And they were in the girl's bathroom and he raped her. That's what occurred. And the father of this girl who was raped, and it was recorded by the school. Yeah, uh, this rape occurred. The father stood up in the school board meeting and said, hey, this policy you have that any boy who wants to identify as a girl can go into the girl's restrooms is wrong. And they shut him down. And when he complained, they had him arrested. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, because he was, you know, some some trans activist came into his face and then he there was a scuffle and then he got arrested. That's what happened. And I think it's the issue is a bit more complex than that. I'm not going to dig up the whole issue. And there's a journalist called Matt, Matt Tabby, if I'm saying his name right, who wrote a whole series of four things on this. And he's an independent journalist. He's on Substack. He's not in the Washington Post or the New York Times because those papers will censor that kind of article right. where someone digs into the truth and looks at nuance and hey there are two sides to this and because in right. that case there were two sides at least I'm not two sides yeah, yeah at least two sides um so yeah I won't get to all the sides of that case but I'm just saying there's a lot of weird stuff going on with this that is super weird I mean and that's that's essentially children behaving in that manner, you know. That yeah. I mean, that's definitely I, I think it's not something I think about as a woman. Like it's it's I'm not I, my brain isn't geared towards that kind of thinking, but it is something I'm gonna be taking into consideration as a woman that these people mm-hmm. who who say that they identify in this way but may not biologically actually be formed in that way can still function in a way that's violent towards women. I think uh, uh, it hurts to say that. Schizophrenia is the word that came to my mind that that sometimes they're women, sometimes they're men or Or just very confused and fucked up, you know? Well, very, (laughs) very much so. Well, and at one point, do we ask the question, Is this whole, I mean, I, I'm clearly you, clearly some people really truly do identify in that manner and, and that's, that's clean and that's wholesome and then mentally healthily sound. Right. But are there instances of extreme mental health that are driving this behavior that do lead towards schizophrenic behaviors that do, you know, actually does it engender more violence towards women to allow for this to happen? It's, 
It's so complicated, which is why I get so frustrated Mm -hmm. that we're not allowed to talk about distinctions because without making these distinctions, we can't have Mm -hmm. these other really important conversations. We just have to capitulate to the sort of overarching agenda, as as we've said, Mm -hmm. of potential transhumanism and of sort of this amalgamation of our humanity. And that to me is extremely disturbing. Yes. Well, and and I I do want to get that book, Abigail Schreiner, who wrote a book about teenage girls getting depressed. And it's hard to be a teenage girl from what I've observed as a teenage boy when I was around. They they don't they don't get treated nice by the boys necessarily or the male figures in their life. And then sometimes the other girls in teenage girls' lives don't treat them nice. Like if you What's, what's that f- Japanese phrase? The nail that stands up will be hammered down. That definitely mm. can apply to teenage girl groups. There's a lot of peer pressure, sure. a lot of weird stuff going on. Um, anyway, there's been a growth in teenage girls wanting to transition and take male hormones, testosterone, uh, because it makes you feel good. When you take testosterone, you know, speaking as someone who's got two little eggs pushing out to, well, not eggs but that's what we say in spanish huevos right? <laughs> right that means balls in spanish um so i can see why if you're depressed and socially inept or whatever taking some testosterone could be seem like a magic pill to Oof. take but then wow. later some of these girls decide they don't really want to be men even after they've cut off their breasts and they've grown facial hair and their voice has dropped um, they don't want to. And, and now they can't have kids, even though they might want to. And she wrote a great book called Irreversible Damage. Um, this woman called Abigail Schreier. And she she kind of went on the book show circuit, but she was shut down heavy by these trans activists because you're not allowed to talk about this stuff. You can't even discuss right. this stuff. And that's what angers me in particular. That you, you can't even speak about the problems occurring because it's off limits. And that's so right. wrong. Right. So I'll put that book in the show notes. It's like, yeah, I'm it's, it's a good book. Yeah. She did she interviewed parents and teenage kids on all sides of it, you know. And she well, didn't come in with an agenda, I don't feel. She just right. saw the there were young it's women hurting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and I, I know a person who um who had a child who identified as male who began the, you know, the process of taking the hormones who went through that process for a number of time, whose mother was trying to get, you know, the, the, um, get the insurance to cover, to have, I can't even say it, have her daughter's breast cut off. Just it, it, my guts were like, have a visceral response to that. But that was the process. That's the process of transitioning, right? And mm-hmm. and then the the, the well, you start really with was... binding. You you start by putting an ace bandage around them, squeezing down. That's right. how people and trans. Because she... I have a lot of trans men friends. You know, I mean, I, I know. And what she did doing. that. She did that, and then she went mm-hmm. with the hormonal replacement, and then she was looking to have the surgery, and her mm-hmm. daughter decided to go back. So. Mm she didn't get as far as having her breast removed, but she will have to, you know, the, the repercussions of putting hormones that are not natural to your system in your system mm-hmm. leaves, it, it mm-hmm. leaves um, consequences. There's uh, consequences. Uh, yeah. To mm-hmm. that, right. Yeah. Yeah. It basically lowers your voice, gives you facial hair, probably makes you infertile in your ovaries, depending on how long you do it. How long you sometimes do it, right? it is reversible. Right. And similarly on the male, you know, men who, you know, boys who want to transition to women, it's, um, you know, has consequences as well. So let's make this, just, you know, do it after people are adults or right. soberly, like yeah. soberly and with a sense of maturity mm-hmm. and actual cognitive recognition of the process that you're mm-hmm. engaging in. Mm-hmm. All right. I think I think I'm talked out, even if you're okay. not. <laughs> hey, yeah, I wonder I think- how, how our audience is dealing with this. I mean, it does relate back. I know we went really deep into the trans stuff and transhumanism and, and social engineering, but it does relate back to how women business people are treated and and how intuition and magic are treated in society. I think it does relate to that. Um because the transhumans don't want intuition, they don't want magical abilities and they want to erase that 
Because, and the reason is because if you have those, why do you need to get a chip in your head? If you have instant access to infinite knowledge and instant pa- infinite power, you're hard to control and you don't need to go through that transhuman well, thing. Unless, well, unless you feel like it, you know. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and it's, you know, it's, I think what it comes back to is, you know, as, as, as a woman entrepreneur who I rely heavily on my, on the, the wisdom of my body, on my cycles, on, you know, everything that from an internal standpoint makes me feel like a woman to, to run my business, to connect with people, to do the work that I do. Um, it, it is an important distinction. Um, and for me, like my work involves helping people make distinctions, make distinctions about their trauma, about their stories, how to take that ball of confusion that gets wrapped up inside of us from being told, no, you're not allowed to think this way. You're not allowed to feel this way, that this is wrong, that you have to show up this way or behave this way. And it's, it's all a part of that issue for me and my work specifically I help people of all genders unpack that massive ball of confusion. So when I see that ball of confusion being added to and like those distinctions being erased in a collective sense, I'm acutely aware of the impact that that has on all of us internally within our psyche. It's just, it it does become that thought police. It does become sort of a means for us to very often gaslight ourselves out of what we feel and what we think and what we know. And whether you're a woman entrepreneur, you lean heavily on your intuition to sort of guide and navigate your business, or you're just another human being who wants to function in a more instinctive way. This is not, this does not promote living from that place in any way, shape or form. Definitely not. I vote for President Justice. <laughs> Not that you're running. Um, no, I mean it. It this adding to this ball of confusion disempowers everyone in a, yeah. in society, and it also, I think, gums up the works of society. You know, society is not running as smoothly as it possibly ran previously. Not to say society in the past was perfect; it had issues too, but. I really think we're getting to a close to a point and we've reached the point where society is just falling apart. Things just don't work. And um, I won't go down that rabbit hole, but I, I just think this is a symptom of something that's so important that we're destroying or our society is being destroyed by various elements. And we won't have a society left if we don't pay attention to this stuff. Um so I think it's that important. Um, I do want to slip in another sci-fi book after we've mentioned 1984 and uh, Brave New World. Here's another one that's great on this stuff, which is uh, it's called First and Last Men by Olaf Stapleton. He wrote it in the 1930s, and it's about how humans could possibly progress through transhumanism and intuition and all kinds of things. And it's a fascinating novel. He, 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 it starts off with time travel back to the first world. There were these like humans who wanted to study history to understand what it was like to be a soldier in the first world war. And why would people do this terrible thing called war, you know? And then it progressed through various epochs of humanity where they had computer sized brains and they did genetic engineering and all kinds of other stuff that he dreamt, dreamt up in his imagination uh, many, you know, nearly 90 years ago, I guess, when he wrote this. Um, but it does, I'm just thinking it actually does speak to these things. And the, the last men in this thing were living on Neptune or something because the sun had expanded and got big and made Earth rather hot. Um, were, I think they were more intuitive and, you know, they were the ones doing the time, mental time travel and stuff and wanted to help out these earlier humans. So hmm. fascinating. Um, if people want to find you online, Miss Justice, Ms. I guess. Ms. <laughs> That's a whole other discussion, right? Miss or Ms. or Mix. I saw another one. MX is a new one that people, some people use. Hmm. And then there's the whole, I, I, I just have to get this in here. You know how Spanish is, 
a very gendered language. And we have yeah. Latino for ma male Latins, and we have Latina with an A for feminine Latins. Yeah. And there's this move to use latex, where you get rid of the O or the A and use next, which is totally anathema to every Latin person I know in Peru. Sure. Um, so. Well, all those romance languages are very, um, like, are gender influenced in the, uh, the O's and the A's and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's what makes it part of a beautiful language, in my view. In fact, okay, I've got to get one more joke in, if that's okay. Right. So you, you go into Google Translate, you put non-binary in and ask it to translate it in Spanish, right? And non-binary means people don't identify, for those listening who don't know, means don't identify male or female or like they're gender fluid and they move around. And the translation in Spanish is either uh, something like no, no, no binary O or no binary A, <laughs> depending on your male or female. Funny. That's funny. Right, yeah, it makes sense though. All right. How do we find you online? Uh, you can visit my website, uh, bedheadmystic.com. You <laughs> can friend me on social media. I'm most active on Facebook out of all the platforms. I write prolifically for Elephant Journal. You can find me elephantjournal.com forward slash Justice Bartlett is my profile. And um, yeah, I, I welcome engagements interactions conversations from anyone from all walks of life fabulous well thank you so much for agreeing to discuss this nuanced and delicate topic on the show and uh great catching up with you likewise thank you get detailed show notes on today's episode together with your free what would it take business intuition guide at intuitiveleadershipmastery.com create a fabulous and profitable day what would it take